Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. If you could just get comfy, we're going to give it a few minutes just so everybody can join us. Thank you for being here. Thanks again. If uh, you're looking for a whale, you came to the right place. This is the virtual whale watch with Oceana. We're very glad to have you. Uh, please just make yourselves comfy and we will get started shortly. And hello again. We have a, quite a few more people joining us. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we're very glad to have you. Um, while we're waiting for everyone to join us, I just wanted to introduce all of you to yourselves. Um, when, uh, when we did the registration, we had a questionnaire and I'm looking at some of the answers. Uh, have you ever seen a whale? And it looks like a little bit more than a quarter of the people said, yes, they'd, they'd seen a whale in real life before. And uh, a little bit less Said, uh, then a quarter said, no, I've never seen a whale in real life before. And about half of the people responded by saying, wait, was that a whale? Uh, it seems like not a lot of people are sure whether they've seen a whale or not. So if you have seen a whale before and you want to see another whale, you're in the right place. If you've never seen a whale before, you're definitely in the right place because that's what we're going to do tonight. And if you're not sure if you've seen a whale before, I've got good news for you. We're in the very capable hands of Boston Harbor Cruises, and they are going to, uh, they're going to teach us how to whale watch. So tonight we're all going to, uh, we're all going to learn how to whale watch. Uh, I would also like to let you know that at the end of our uh, whale watch this evening, we will have a few minutes for Q and A. So please feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A panel. Uh, we definitely wanna make sure that we're able to answer as many as we can uh, as we'd like, to, we'd like to get to all of our panelists and hear them all speak. Uh, my name is Brian Langloss. I'll be your host for tonight. I'm with Oceana in New York. Please follow me at Oceana in New York, either on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with our virtual programming. Uh, we also have a really great event, uh, a few events actually this week, because guess what? It's Whale Week. And one of my colleagues and friends is in Georgia. You can follow her at Oceana in Georgia and keep up with some of the really incredible programming that uh, we have lined up for Whale Week. Happy Whale Week, everybody. If you'd like to know more about our lineup for Whale Week, please go to the Q&A section and ask, tell me about Whale Week, and we'll, we'll make sure we give you the calendar. We are going on our Whale Watch tonight with Boston Harbor Cruises. So again, we're with experts. We're, gonna, we're definitely going to see some whales here. They know where to go, and they know how to watch for whales. Very big thank you, Boston Harbor Cruises, for having us. And thank you uh, to the New England Aquarium these vessels leave from the New England Aquarium in Boston. So uh, we're very excited uh, for this opportunity to do this virtually, uh, just so that we can all see. Now, uh, before we, we meet our, our whale watch expert, I just wanna give you some context as to where we're going. We're very lucky on the Northeast to have uh, quite a few national marine sanctuaries. This is a map of the National Marine Sanctuaries across the United States. And uh, we will be visiting Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. You see it's on the upper right-hand corner. It's uh, just offshore of Boston, offshore of Cape Cod. I'm sure a lot of us have been there. And a uh, very big thank you to uh, NOAA and to uh, the people at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundations for the work that you do in protecting these very important habitats. This is also a very celebratory uh, month to visit Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary because it just turned uh, 28 as a National Marine Sanctuary uh, for 28 years. So happy birthday, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. We'd also very much like to thank the Center for Coastal Studies for being here tonight. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot from them about ocean conservation and the work they do as well, coming up shortly. 
But first, I'm very excited to introduce you to Laura Howells. Hi, Laura, how's it going? Good, how are you? Fantastic, thank you so much for being with us, Laura. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, Laura is the Director of Research and Education at Boston Harbor Cruises. Laura takes usually takes people out in real life uh, for a whale watch. She's the head naturalist there. Uh, she's also an excellent photographer. Some of the photographs we're gonna see are actually uh, Laura's, but it sounds like all of the uh, naturalists who go out are, are pretty good photographers. And uh, something that I'm excited to hear Laura talk about is how she uses whale sightings and photography to create a record of where the whales are in an effort to, uh, to assist them, to, to help them. Because it sounds like whales need a lot of help. Uh, oh, and uh, at Boston Harbor Cruises, please be sure to follow at Boston Harbor Cruises to keep up with their schedule. So, Laura, uh, you're taking us out to Selwagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary, is that correct? Yep, that's where we're going today. Awesome. Could you tell us what is so special about this National Marine Sanctuary and what, uh, what, are, some, uh, what are some of the things we can expect to see? So what makes Stellwagen Bay special is the bathymetry of it, which we'll learn a lot about today. It's an underwater plateau, so basically an island with a flat top. And that's a perfect area for upwelling to happen. So nutrients get rushed up to the surface once they run into Stellwagen Bank. And that helps build the food web, lots of phytoplankton, small schooling fish, and then of course, a variety of wildlife, which is what makes our home so special. So it sounds like uh, before you even get out there and just really on your way out there, you see a lot of different species. Yeah, so many different species. So not even just whales, but for instance, you'll see seabirds, tooth whales, such as Atlantic white-sided dolphins, ocean sunfish, and basking sharks, as well as seals, all sorts of animals. This looks like kind of a menacing creature. I, it looks like this basking shark's mouth is wide open. Uh, it is. So right now it's it's filtering plankton from the water, but it doesn't have teeth. Um, not like your stereotypical teeth when you think of um, a great white shark, for instance. So um, it's, it's more or less pretty harmless. And of course, uh, baleen whales are what we're treated to the most on Stellwagen Bank. There's a variety of species. This is, of course, uh, a beautiful image of a humpback whale. And uh, we see there's similar species like this, such as the fin whale and the minke whale. This is a say whale uh, that's act actively feeding at the surface. And this is a North Atlantic right whale. And I want to point out that this photo is heavily zoomed and cropped in. Uh, if we do see a right whale, we typically, if we do see them, they're in the spring. So even though it's a very rare chance to actually see a right whale, I wanted to make sure to include them as this is a highly critically endangered species. There's only currently an estimated 356 left of them in their population. So the, the sightings that we have of right whales can be used for conservation measures. I look at waving at us. That looks like a, uh, that looks like an arm. Is that whale waving at us? So that is a pectoral flipper of a humpback whale. So unlike many of the other whale species, humpbacks have extremely long flippers. Their hand bones are stretched out and then their fingers were fused together to create these large pectoral flippers. But so sometimes if you're lucky, you might see some surface activity where they're slapping them or in the water or stretching out in the air, such as this photo. So more of an anatomy of a whale. So this is a head of a humpback whale. So there's a lot to look at, especially if you haven't seen um, a whale photograph like this before. You can see the two blowholes on top of its head. So essentially their nose moved to the top of their head. You can see the top of its mouth is pretty bumpy. There's actually enlarged hair follicles attached to them. You can see some of the baleen, which we'll point out more throughout this inside their mouth. And of course their very large chin and ventral grooves. So here's more of that baleen. So what I mean by a baleen whale, it's a whale that doesn't have teeth. 
Instead, they have these thin, hairy plates that hang from their top roof of their mouth that creates a filtration system where only water can escape through the spaces between each plate, but the food gets trapped inside. So more of the anatomy. So here's the back of a humpback whale. Uh, that's their dorsal fin is that nubby thing on the back. And you can see uh, the backside of their, uh, what we call um, their tail stock or peduncle. It's interesting to see more than one whale. Are whales typically social? So that's a, that's a good question. So large whales like a humpback, they generally are solitary most of the time. If you think about it, they're feeding on sometimes one to two tons of food a day. So it does make sense for them to spread out. You don't necessarily see them together as much as you would killer whales that might stick together throughout their lifetime. But that being said, we do sometimes see them come together in groups to feed and also in breeding grounds. And there's still a lot we're learning about their associations. And so here's more of kind of the whole stretched out body of a humpback. As you can see, you usually don't see the whole body of a whale. You can see the very tip of their head pointed out on the left side of the photo. Um, it's back, or some call it the humpback whale because it has a little bit of a lump in front of that dorsal fin compared to some of the other species that we see. You can see just how long the tail stalk goes to and then it's fluke uh, about to kind of peeking out at the end there. Wow. And so this is a beautiful image. You're always lucky if you get to see this, a humpback will breach. So very one of the few times where you might see almost its whole body. And so you could see those big long pectoral flippers, the ventral grooves, which I'll talk more about. And um, yeah, how much power they have to throw themselves out of the water like that is quite amazing. That is incredible. About how, how much would you say a humpback whale weighs on a good week? So a humpback, if, uh, ideally they weigh about 30 to 40 tons, which is about 60 to 80,000 pounds. And they're roughly about the length of your big yellow school bus to give you an idea of their size. Thank you. And I just love seeing this because, you know, seeing this uh, underbelly, the way all that water is all kind of, you know, in parallel lines uh, streaming down, the texture of the whale uh, the, you know, the underbelly, at least, of the whale, it kind of reminds me of corduroy. Yeah, that's a perfect thing to notice. So um, some species of baleen whale, these are called rorquals. They have something that's called ventral grooves, which are also like called pleats along their throat and kind of underside of their body. And that helps um, them in feeding. So here's a humpback whale feeding at the surface. And you can see those ventral grooves expanded out like an accordion. So it's almost like a frog where it's, its throat expands out. And what's happening here is that there's water and uh, seafood, probably small schooling fish called the sand lance inside its mouth. And uh, once it engorges all that water and food, it pushes out the water with its tongue. And that's when the water strains out through the baleen plates and it'll shrink back to its original normal size. And so here's what look the mouth is open. You can see just how large their mouths are. They open about 90 degrees and it can take, you know, five, 10,000 gallons of water depending on the species. So you can see that mouth uh, fully full up with water um, and food right now. And again, for, here's the lower side of the whale. So you can see it's a dorsal fin. Uh, that's one of the features we use to identify individuals. And it's tail stock. If you're wondering what those knobs are along the tail stock, those are the vertebrae sticking out um, along its skeleton. And you can see a little bit of the fluke um, and some entanglement scarring on the lower part of the fluke there as well, which we'll learn more about today. And of course, the fluke, uh, that's probably the most common behavior you would see with a humpback whale as they're taking a dive. And I also like this photo because it's a mystery to what they're doing under the water, um, at least in the past it was. And it's a reminder that they spend 90% of their time below the surface. So we only get a little glimpse of what they do when they come up. Oh, well, wow. now, you know, so looking at this, there appears to be a lot of commotion. I see bubbles, I see birds. Uh, this whale is doing the corduroy thing. 
What's happening here, Laura? There's, there seems to be a lot going on here. Yeah, so this is a behavior called bubble net feeding. So it's a group of whales working together. And as I mentioned, they have that nose on the top of their head. And not only do they use that to breathe, but humpbacks have figured out that they can expel and blow water, uh, blow bubbles underwater and create nets and all sorts of formation to help bring their prey to the surface. And it's quite an amazing behavior. We've even noticed different patterns. And so this is a spiral bubble net where it's making columns of air and going in a, a, a spiral formation. And often the other whales will be helping as they do this. And then once they, yeah, once they bring the prey to the surface, yep, they'll, those bubbles will come up and then that's where they'll be feeding and you'll see them bring that their mouth up. And sometimes you'll see filtering at the surface. And so this is a lunge. So sometimes they'll come up with a lot more for force. Um, so lunge feeding is uh, probably the mo one of the most dramatic behaviors you can see uh, rushing out of the surface. Sometimes you can see fish flying out of corners of their mouths. That goal there is trying to get some leftovers as well. Yes, yeah, so I was gonna say there's a lot of birds hanging out with the whales. Is that, is that common when you see whales? Yeah, so if there is prey at the surface, the birds are feeding on what the whales feed on. So you'll, uh, if you see a lot of birds around, that means there's probably going to be some surface feeding as well. And so this is a, a fantastic behavior to talk about kick feeding. And so what you're seeing here is the whale is taking its tail and it's slamming at the surface. We'll see different patterns in how they do this. The kick feeding, it's a unique behavior that we see on the Stellwagen and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And it's been observed that the whales also teach each other this behavior. So it's one of the cool things uh, and studies that have come out from collecting data on whale watch boats. And so they'll incorporate bubbles as well. And we believe they do this tail activity to help corral the prey or maybe stun it. Uh, but it's a fantastic behavior. It's also known as double loop feeding, which you'll get to learn about why just a little bit later. Uh, but it's one of the unique behaviors that you could see out on Snow Wagon Bank. Beautiful. And so, yeah, breaching. So you're always, I like to tell everyone, you're always lucky if you get to see a whale breach. That's when they jump out of the water. Uh, maybe about 10 to 15% of the time do we actually get to see it. So you're always lucky when you get to see it. Now, Laura, why do they breach? Why do whales it's fun to do this. Why do whales breach like this? So that is the that is the golden question. So the short answer is we really don't know. Uh, there's many hypotheses we think as why they do this. For instance, if you look at this whale, it has a ton of barnacles on its chin and flipper. So it might be a way to knock off those barnacles or whale lice. Uh, it could be a social behavior. Uh, sometimes we see it more actively breaching in breeding grounds. Um, it could just be for fun. Sometimes it's been observed in more windy conditions. The answer is it's probably many reasons, and there's no rhyme or reason as to when we get to see it. So, um, yeah, it's one of those great mysteries that, you know, if we don't solve it one day, it's still, it's just amazing to see. It sure is. It sure is. Now, these whales, again, they look social. I see bubbles. It looks like they're having fun. What, what's happening here? So this is a behavior called lobtailing. So it looks like both of them are lobtailing. The one in the back has its tail up completely vertical and then sometimes they'll do it forwards or backwards depending on what they wanna do. And it's another surface activity, which again, we don't know quite why they do it, um, but it's definitely a cool behavior to see offshore. And here's another dramatic tail breach. And again, remember, this is a 40 ton animal and being able to propel itself out of the water like that is quite amazing. Being a whale looks awesome. It just seems like they're out there just splashing and just, you know, really having a good time. Is it all fun and games being a whale? So it's there, remember when they're here for Stellwag and Bake, it's a feeding ground. So their primary focus is to feed as much as they possibly can. They want to put on about 10 to 20,000 pounds while they're here. And so it is interesting, you know, when you do see surface activity like this, it does expel a lot of energy. 
Uh, but for the most part, while they're here, they're concentrating on finding food. And last, it's again, what, what most common behavior they would see, this is a fin whale, which is the second largest whale on earth. And that's spouting, or we call it a blow. And you can really see um, that breath. A lot of people think it's water, uh, but it's actually air condensing to form a mist. So one of the things that I thought was so interesting about going on a whale watch was how much record keeping was going on. Uh, could you tell us, Laura, what do you do when you when you journalize that you see a certain type of whale somewhere, um, and then you start keeping a record of which whales you see? Uh, what is this database, and uh, and what do you do with it? So we have a, a wonderful team of naturalists and interns that collect information on the behaviors that we're seeing, the location, um, the surrounding conditions, and we also use photographs. Uh, to identify the individual whales that we see. And thanks to this kind of information, we've learned so much about this population. We're probably spoiled compared to other areas in the world with how much we know about uh, the humpbacks that we see here. And so for instance, this is a humpback whale and we name them based on the patterns to help us remember who they are in the field. So this is a whale named Hancock. If you look on the right, there's this kind of squiggly right, um, pattern it looks like a signature, so the John Hancock, a big uh, loud signature. And uh, the majority of the time, the, the patterns that you see, they're natural. It's a birthmark that sticks with them for life. Well, just you know, on the subject of the kind of squiggly pattern, uh, this close up you know, reminds me, I see these four parallel lines. And it kind of reminds me of that little handheld garden rake that you use to you know, rake up soil. What is that? So yeah, we call them rake marks. As I mentioned, their patterns are natural, but we do sometimes see scarring from human interactions. And But this is actually a, a natural interaction from a killer whale or an orca. The orcas are in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's found that about 10% of the humpbacks that we see have scars that they had from orca whale bites, most likely as a calf. And so this particular humpback whale gets the name music, and the orca bite scar that it has conveniently looks like a music note. Um, so it's a, a very nice glue to see. And so that's where she gets that marking. And this is Nile. So this, this uh, squiggle on the left side of the fluke looks like the Nile River. And she's quite a, a frequent visit, visitor to Stellwagen Bank. That must be very exciting for you to you know, get to know these whales over time and to see them return. Yeah, I like to tell people I have a lot of practice every day you go out in the water, it's like a flash card and you slowly get to get to know the flukes and know their individual behaviors, see if they come back with a calf next year. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. And we have Echo. So Echo also has an orca bite scar on the left side of her tail and it looks like a repeated line. So she gets the name Echo. Oh, yes, I see that. And of course, salt. And we'll see a lot about salt throughout this. Uh, our whale watch today, uh, we saw a photo earlier of her dorsal fin that looks like, like salt was sprinkled on it. So what's important about salt, she was first seen in the mid 1970s. We're still seeing her today. and what was hel helpful about her is she was one of the first whales they're like oh they, they differ we can tell them apart her dorsal fin was very helpful in that the scientists and captains on fishing boats and then later whale watch boats we began to notice that each fluke is different and so she's known as the grand dame of Stellwagen bank she's definitely the most famous whale that you could see out here you know almost every year since the mid-1970s uh, she has so far 15 caps 16 grand calves and now three great grand calves. So we're able to track um, her family tree like many other whales. And so she's such an important whale to Stellwagen Bank. So she's great to get to know on this whale watch today. And it was because you said she had such a distinct tail that uh, people first started saying, wow, you can tell these whales apart. Yep, exactly. And so luckily, you know, 
compared to other species that have natural markings, humpbacks are one of the easiest to identify and they are almost always flukes. That means when they're diving, they lift that tail out of the water. And so with photo identification, which is what we do on the whale watches, uh, we can track who we're seeing throughout the season. Now, you know, I see this, you know, this poor whale with, there are just birds just walking all over this whale. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, is it difficult being a whale? Is it, would you say that it's tricky to be a whale these days? So, yeah, so this is a good photo to remind you that whales need space. Um, not necessarily from birds, but definitely from boats. So as a whale watch, and of course, any other boat out on the water, it's important to remember that whales do need space. Uh, in the Northeast region, there are whale watch guidelines. All of the marine mammals in the U.S. are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Some of them are endangered, such as the North Atlantic right whale that we saw. So it's a reminder that whale watching responsibly is important. That's why there's programs such as Whale Sense that let you know what are responsible whale watches on the East Coast and now in parts of the West Coast. And they do face many problems with human interactions. The two biggest ones are ship strike with vessels and entanglement in fishing gear, uh, which we'll talk more about today as well. Yes, and, and if you would like to know more about entanglement, uh, Oceana is screening this week for Whale Week, um, a movie called Entangled, and uh, we'll talk more about it. I'm sure perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, if you wanna just go to the Q&A section and ask, you know, tell me about Whale Week, uh, we'll make sure that you, you get the information to, so that you're able to enjoy the screening. Oh, and speaking of enjoying, I just, as you say, when these whales breach, it's, it's just, you know, not only, it sounds like it's rare to see them in the first place, but it is so spectacular that this school bus of an animal can just lift itself so high out of water. What, you know, when you're on a boat, Lara, and you see this, how does that make you feel? And, and what, what is the experience like for everyone on the boat when you hear the splash and, and you, you see it just right there in the ocean? So what I love about this photo is the unexpected and that you never know what you're gonna see when you're out on the water. Uh, but I'm lucky enough to get to do this, you know, all throughout the summer, every season. And you would think I would get bored doing it, but in reality, you just, you never know it's gonna happen. And sometimes you get treated to a magical view like this, or maybe you just see an interesting behavior that maybe isn't as flashy, but it's something new that you saw. So I'm still seeing new things each year and learning new things. And so it's, it's great to appreciate them that nature can offer something so spectacular. Yes, indeed. And I'm sure for everyone on the boat, uh, I didn't get to see it, but I was on a whale watch and I heard the splash and I heard everyone gasp and it just seemed to be over with so quickly. But what I did feel was this entire boat of people, everyone just felt just so glad, just so happy to, you know, that this animal's out there. What, uh, what is it like on a Boston Harbor cruise vessel when, you know, you have just a really good whale watch day and they're breaching like this? What are, what are, are people snapping pictures? Are people laughing? No, oh, yeah, it's it's a great environment. I mean, obviously people are happy. They want to get as many pictures as you can, but I try to encourage them as well to get some looks without the camera. And um, yeah, it, sometimes you'll have people coming on the whale watch that maybe they were a brother that wasn't quite as excited about the whales. But if you see something like this, this can stir up that passion and maybe get the, you know, this is a moment to teach them about conservation as well and maybe get them encouraged to explore science or the conservation field. And so, yeah, it's a wonderful feeling. And I love when as many people, if not the whole boat gets to see the breach because that's what I always want them to see. Now, um, a question's come in that uh, is specifically for you. How did you get involved in whale conservation? What was your career track? Oh, great. So. Um, like many kind of marine mammal people I know, I am from the Midwest, I grew up outside of Chicago. So just like that picture, there's a big draw to the ocean, especially if you don't live by it. And so I decided to do my undergrad degree at College of the Atlantic and get as close to the ocean as I can to get some hands-on experience. And um, I work with a nonprofit there to do an internship. Just like uh, we have our interns that work with us here on our, our Boston Harbor Cruises Whale Watch. And that's when I learned that 
There's a lot of conservation data collected on whale watch boats that work with small nonprofits. So whale watches are a good way to get out on the water, sea time is expensive, help collect that data. And I've always been focused and you know eager to help with the conservation as well as these whales. So I found whale watching to be a good platform to kind of work with all those, those angles. And speaking about whale conservation, what do you do with this data that you collect on these boats? Uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I love this photo. These are some of our New England Aquarium Marine Mammal Education and Research interns. So they help us collect the data. Um, naturalists also take photos of the whales. And so whale watch data can help in many ways. First off, by the boat just being out on the water we kind of provide eyes on the water throughout the season. So for instance, if we see an entangled whale, an injured whale, we can report it. We can monitor whales that were disentangled. Uh, date location data, for instance, can help uh, produce what's called a right whale dynamic management area. So if we see right whales, we can alert uh, scientists to know where those whales are and create a, a temporary slow zone area. It was also instrumental in helping change the Bostic shipping lane to help reduce whale ship strikes, which you'll learn more about today. And all the data that we collect, uh, right now we, we roughly have about 40,000 whale sightings over the last uh, eight years. We share that with the Center for Coastal Studies. So that helps uh, contribute to their long-term catalog. So for instance, when I told you about SALT, uh, I wasn't around in the mid 1970s, but thanks to this uh, long-term catalog, I know more about salt that I can teach you about today. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And exciting news, we're not the only ones out on the water tonight on our whale watch. We are also joined by the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Massachusetts, uh, by Dr. Juke Robbins. How are you, Dr. Robbins? I'm great. How are you? And how are you, Laura? I'm good. I'm good, Juke. Um, it's great to be out on the water with you today. Yes, yes. Dr. Robin, Dr. Robbins is the director of the Humpback Whale Studies Program at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown. Uh, you can definitely enjoy following the work that they do at Coastal Studies on social media. So Dr. Robbins, what about Stellwagen Bank uh, do you think we sh everyone should know? Well, yeah, so Laura's given us such an amazing introduction to the Stowagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is, we know, a very important place for whales. What maybe not everybody does know is that that's actually part of a larger feeding range for this population that spans the entire Gulf of Maine from Nantucket to Nova Scotia. So whether you've been on a whale watch out of Massachusetts, like this virtual whale watch, or maybe you've been lucky enough to also perhaps go out of New Hampshire or Maine or New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, the whales that you've seen there, those are all part of this same population. And those of us here at the Center for Coastal Studies, um, I direct the Humpback Whale Program, as uh, Brian has mentioned, and our re research really focuses on the entire population. And so to do that, we really need to extend our view to this larger scale. And um, so what we had just seen were some examples of our humpback whale sightings that span the Gulf of Maine, so that really, whether you're out on Stellwagen or somewhere else in the Gulf of Maine, you may see humpback whales, but you might also see whale researchers. And that would be you. So are you, are you frequently out on the water? Yes, we are out on the water um, many times during uh, the season. Our season actually goes from March through December. And we uh, focus a lot in the southwestern Gulf of Maine. But in addition, we do cruises that cover the entire US and Canadian Gulf of Maine. Fantastic. And um, it sounds like uh, you and, and other people who are in the know know whale. This sounds like this is the famous whale I keep hearing about, salt. Yeah, indeed. This is salt and Laura gave us a great um, introduction to her. Um, what we're looking at here, as she's already explained, this is salt's fluke. She has a unique pigmentation. And for those that aren't aware, there's actually a formal cataloging process that we use to keep track of individual humpback whales. And we do that based on, on fluke images exactly like this linked to other data. And so uh, Laura mentioned that SALT, she's also known as the Grand Dam of Stellwagen Bank. She's really an excellent ex example of how the whales that 
we see here in love and you guys see on whale watches and in, in, real, in the real world, um, they're also important to understanding the population and for the species overall. And part of what makes salt special, Laura mentioned that uh, she was first seen back in the 1970s. Actually, scientists here at the center, we were on the first trips that saw salt back in the day. And there's a long history of scientists collaborating with whale watching uh, companies and naturalists. These are platforms of opportunity. These are people on the water, as Laura mentioned. And all of this provides opportunities to collect data. So salt was actually one of the first whales that we ever cataloged in our Gulf of Maine humpback whale catalog. And just a shout out that the Gulf of Maine whales, that's about 3000 individuals that we cataloged over 40 years, but there's a larger catalog, the North Atlantic humpback whale catalog run by our colleagues at um, Allied Whale at the College of the Atlantic. They're keeping track of whales across the entire ocean basin, more than 10,000 whales. And just like salt was one of the first in our catalog, she was also one of the first in theirs as well. So one of the first individuals in the entire North Atlantic that we cataloged as an individual. And Dr. Robbins, could you tell us about SALT's family tree? We see all of these different flukes. What are we looking at when we look at this family tree? Yeah, so essentially what you're seeing are um, what we consider the identifying feature of the average humpback whale, which is the underside of the tail. And so what we do in, in collaboration with partners um, whale watch companies, um, other scientists, is that we're going out and we're collecting uh, these photographs and associated data. And we use these, this information. It's really quite a, um, perhaps a quiet and collaborative process behind the scenes that's keeping track of these individuals across their entire lifetime. So what you're seeing here, salt at the top. And um, as Laura mentioned, she has 36 individuals within her known lineage. And this is largely, wow. partly because we've seen her for such a long period of time, but she has amazing um, consistency to our area. And so we've actually seen her every single year um, oh. since the mid 1970s. And her offspring, many of those we see every single year. And so we have tremendous detail about um, her, her sightings, her offspring, their ages, because we saw them first as calves, it's just a wealth of information that we painstakingly curate um, in collaboration with uh, folks like BHC and Laura who collect those data on the water and share them with us. Fantastic. And I hear you describing this you know, incredible record that you have on SALT's ancestry uh, and you know, the, her lineage. And it also, it just sounds like this, you know, this famous whale that her sightings are are kind of big news and, and very well recorded. Uh, would you say that given uh, her pedigree and celebrity that salts, you know, our salts, the humpback whale could possibly be a princess of whales? <laughs> yes, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, she's certainly, she's royalty for sure in our community um, and known throughout the world like, like royalty. Um, she's a celebrity, and I would say that she's someone that whale watchers, naturalists, scientists alike are all very happy and excited when we see her return each year. That's wonderful. And it sounds like the Center for Coastal Studies, uh, it, that you have been able, just to go back to this image briefly, it sounds like you have been able to use this record on SALT to create a lot of really interesting research. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, uh, for sure. So salt, her family tree is amazingly well populated because of how regularly we see her. That's not true for every whale. So we do have to use other tools um, in our science discipline uh, to try to fill in the blanks. And some of that work is genetic. Now for the average female and her lineage, we're piecing together um, some of the offspring when they might've been born through genetics. Um, but the amazing thing about SALT is that we've actually um, collaborated with her, if you will, um, in a genetic study that is among the most intense that you can have, and that is the study of the genome. Many wow. people probably will have heard um, the, the term sequencing the genome. These days, for humans, you can do that um, a lot more readily and less expensively than might have been in the past. And really what that is is just 
really extracting and assembling and documenting the genetic code of an individual and under, using that to understand all kinds of things about them. Now in wildlife, it's typically just one member of a species um, that we might have the, the genome sequenced and we might use that in, to understand that species. And the actual individual for whom there is only one sequenced genome for a humpback whale and it's salt. So salt is actually, she's the one and only humpback whale to have her genome sequenced from scratch. And so it's amazing to think that the genetic code of this famous whale is really the one that's gonna teach the world about this species. Oh, Dr. Robbins, that's fantastic. It sounds like SALT took you on a really deep dive in researching genetics. Uh, but you also mentioned another uh, pretty interesting test that SALT helped develop. Yeah, so um, in addition to, which actually she's been part of almost every single research project that we've, we've done to better understand and, and conserve humpback whales. But um, previously we saw that lineage where we could see the calves, um, and all of the offspring of her over time. As we build that, what we're actually building is information about her reproduction. And when you go to other populations in the world, we don't necessarily see a female every year, or, or we might only see um, a female after perhaps something as terrible has happened to her calf. And so we don't know really um, the full accuracy of her reproduction. But Thanks to this detailed uh, information about uh, salt and her, um, her reproduction, we were actually able to use this to, to develop with partners a humpback whale pregnancy test. And this is something that can now reliably tell us from a, a, just a, a small um, uh, sample uh, whether a female was pregnant or not. And this is basically all based on this detail of information that we have from New England. We're also uh, learning how to age individual humpback whales from skin samples, again, based on this detailed information. And that's helping us to understand humpback whales in all different parts of the world. And Dr. Robbins, is this the fin that gave Salt her name? Uh, yes, it is. So as you can see, she's in the back and who's in the front, this is actually um, her with one of her calves um, back in uh, 2006. So in the back, you can see she's got the, um, white scarring on the dorsal that just looks like it's coated with salt. And that's where the, the name came from. Wonderful. And you were saying how, how much you're out on the water. Could you talk to us please about what the Center for Coastal Studies does, uh, not just in terms of research that helps advance whale research, whale conservation, but really some of the direct action you take to, to, to help whales who are in trouble. Yeah, so it's direct action that we take, but in collaboration with Eyes on the Water, knowledgeable folks like BHC and Laura and her team. And so basically what we know is that um, humans and human activities can inadvertently impact whales as we overlap in the ocean. And one of the issues that whales face globally is uh, the problem of be becoming entangled in fishing gear. Um, which can cause injuries and even death in some cases. So it's a, a very serious thing. Um, but uh, if you uh, actually have a team nearby, which we at the center do, um, and someone who is uh, able to observe a whale while it's still entangled and stops what they're doing, calls the hotline, you can see report a, a, an entanglement, call this number if you're in the Stellweg and Bank area. If that happens, um, one of our um, team members will answer the phone, will ask you some questions, and they will deploy a boat and come out and try to uh, remove the gear. And it's a really important way that whale watching companies, um, as well as all of you passengers aboard the boat, can do something quite immediate to help us help whales. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Robbins, for to you and Center for Coastal Studies for being out there and, and helping these creatures who, uh, who should not suffer from being entangled. And again, if you um, would like to know more about um, entanglement and whales, uh, go to the Q&A section and ask about the screening of entangled and we'll let you know how to follow it. Uh, and lastly, just to go back to a map of Stellwagen National Marine Sanctuary, would you tell us please uh, what are we looking at here? 
essentially what you were looking at, you can see the Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, and then you see all of these colors, and then you see some white spots. All of the colors are um, basically a representation of the where baleen whales, including humpback whales, are distributed throughout the National Marine Sanctuary. And this is based on you know, decades of data that was collected in large part from whale watching boats. And um, this information was shared with the, the Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary so they could start to put their minds around um, the overlap between whales and how they might, and shipping, and how they might be able to work with the industry to potentially move shipping lane, lanes to reduce ship strike risk, which I think he's going to talk about. Dr. Duke Robbins, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, be sure to check out everyone, the Center for Coastal Studies on Facebook, uh, and also to check out their website. They do some really important work out there. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Uh, you. Turning now to, again, also on the water uh, with us tonight, Dr. David Wiley, uh, who is a research coordinator at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, before we, we say hello, definitely check them out at SBNMS on Facebook to uh, follow the work they do. How are you, Dr. Wiley? I'm good, Brian. Um, nice to be here with this boatload of people. Everybody looks quite happy. The, the weather looks good, no, no big waves. Yes, it, it's perfect weather where I'm sitting. Um, Dr. Wiley, would you help us please better understand you know, this map and uh, what the implications of having a national marine sanctuary so close to Boston. If I may just kind of try to figure this out, to the left we see this circular shape and that appears to be the area around Boston Harbor, is that right? Yeah, what, what you're looking at at first is a great example of the collaborative nature of a national marine sanctuary. You know, we rarely do anything in isolation. Uh, so as Duke was saying, this is a compilation of lots and lots of sightings from the Center for Coastal Studies and the Whale Center of New England and others. And they were uh, nice enough to really give us all of their data to try to figure out something, which is, were whales in danger from ships? There were some whales that are getting shit hit by ships in the sanctuary. Um, you don't wanna be a national marine sanctuary known for having ship strikes, collisions between whales and vessels. Uh, so we wanted to figure out what was going on that was uh, contributing to whales getting hit. So we first mapped out where the whales were. Um, as Juke mentioned, the red areas are high um, whale density areas. The blue are low density areas. And the white dots are a little special, more special because those are right whales. So we wanted to know where all the whales were. And when we plotted it out and mapped it out as you're seeing here, um, the shipping lanes, which the original shipping lanes are those dotted lines that you can see. Um, they went right through the highest areas of whale aggregation, whale use. And then we could use these data to look in the middle of the sanctuary, there seemed to be an area that was of low whale use. We said, well, maybe if we shifted the traffic lanes, um, we could reduce the risk of whales getting hit in the sanctuary. And we went and worked with the maritime industry in Boston. Again, one of the things that the sanctuary really tries to do is work with stakeholders uh, to try to come up with joint solutions. You know, my job is really to understand what marine life does and what humans do to try to separate them in time and space, or at least come up with um, ways of minimizing their impact. And so we worked with the industry in Boston, a group called the Port Operators Group. And after a bunch of months of working together, we actually uh, identified the darker lines through the sanctuary as low risk. And actually that reduced the overlap of whales um, by about 80%, and for right whales in particular, by about 56%. Uh, so when we moved those shipping lanes in 2007, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we haven't had any ship strikes um, in the sanctuary since that time. So it was one of those great examples of, of nonprofits like the Center for Coastal Studies, um, the Boston shipping community being brought together by the sanctuary to, to reduce a, a, or minimize a problem uh, that had been ongoing. Again, not that lots of whales are being hit every year, um, but particularly in the case of right whales, just a single right whale being killed a year um, can put the population in decline. Yes, and I think yeah. as, as Laura and Juke are both saying, right whales is a species we're all terribly concerned about right now. There's only about 150 left. The population trend is going down. 
uh, right whales could actually be extinct in our lifetime unless we do something different. A nice map of the sanctuary. You can see the left one is kind of uh, showing where it is relative to Boston and Cape Cod. It's really an urban sanctuary just offshore of all these major population centers. On the right is something that Laura was talking about earlier. Um, it shows the top topography of the sanctuary where it goes from deep water to shallow water very quickly. And this creates those upwelling currents. Uh, all right, spreading fertilizer over your front lawn. It creates lots of life um, to create there, to, to live there. Everything from phytoplankton to zooplankton to whales and birds. So no, really Harley, productive uh, place. That's wonderful. And you, you spend a lot of your time out on the water at the Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. What, how do you spend your time out there? Yeah, I really have a great job, I have to admit. Um, I, I do all sorts of different things. You know, the nice thing about the sanctuary is we take a really ecological look at things. So we're talking mostly about whales, but we also put satellite tags on seabirds. We do forage fish act uh, research. We do lots of things. But what you're looking at here uh, is we put suction cup based tags in the back, back of whales. So we're not whale watching here. We have to have a special permit to come this close. But at the tip of that pole, is a tag that's about the size of maybe, oh, an orange. Um, it's got suction cups on it that attach to the whales. So we top it out the whale on the back with that pole. Um, the suction cup attaches it to the whale and then the whale swims off and tells us what it's doing underwater. And that's what, that's what we see here then. This is the data that you gather from that tagging, is that correct? Right, so this is, um, using a software program called track plot that was invented just for our research by Colin Ware at the University of New Hampshire who specializes in this kind of stuff. So this isn't a cartoon or an artist depiction. This is really taking the data from that tag. The tag gives you pitch, roll, heading, um, depth at 50 times a second, sometimes even more depending how we program it. So it actually maps out what the whale is doing underwater. Wow, look, look at him go. Yep, Laura was talking to you about uh, something called uh, lobtail feeding or kick feeding, and we call it double loop feeding because basically what the animal's doing is it goes underwater, and you can see one of these circles, it blows a circle of bubbles, and then it comes up and it does that lobtail onto the surface with a bang, and then it scoots underneath and goes down a body length and comes up and grabs its fish. And when you're seeing Laura's pictures of those mouths wide open, um, that's what it's done. So it's blown some bubbles that'll correct the fish. It then hits its flukes on the surface, we think to scare the fish into a tighter formation. And it comes up through that mass of fish with its mouth open uh, to gulp them up. So, so what we're looking this is, at it, a whale fishing. This is how a whale fishes. That's amazing. Yeah, and you're looking at one, two, three, four um, fishing loops there. So it's gone down, done, done a loop, taken a breath, gone down, taken a loop. Fantastic. Different style. This is not kick feeding, but this is bubble netting. So the, the whales actually corral fish by swimming in concentric circles while they're blowing the bubbles. Um, and that concentrates the fish into a tighter and tighter mass. So that the whale comes up through them uh, again with its mouth open, gulping them up. We've seen groups as, as many as 10 and 12 animals um, working together to create these huge bubble nets. And wow. sometimes they do it cooperatively. Um, other times, other whales will come in and raid their nets. Um, so um, humpback whale behavior is quite plastic and pretty complicated. Um, so like they, they do all sorts of different things. Now and on the subject of- it in different ways. So, so this is- Cooperation, you were saying that, uh, I remember when you told me about Whale Alert, uh, this is an app that you said uh, you can actually download and use on your phone. What, what is this? Yeah, I would encourage everybody to, to go to whalealert.org and uh, you can download this on your Android device or your iOS device. And basically, we initially worked with this with the Boston Harbor Pilot Group um, because there are certain things that we want mariners to do in the ocean, such as slow down where whales are. And the mariners said, yeah, well, that's great, but we don't know where the whales are. So we said, okay, well, let's help you. So we basically created this app that shows them all the things they need to know um, to avoid hitting whales. So the circles with whale tails that you're seeing there are acoustic buoys that we have through the sanctuary that will locate right whales and tell boats if there's right whales in the shipping lanes. The brown area that you'll see 
Um, NOAA has designated areas called seasonal management areas, where at certain times and places, boats are required to slow down to 10 knots. And using this app, they can tell where they are and where those places are. Um, the gray square that you're seeing down at the bottom is what's called a dynamic management area. So if whales suddenly appear someplace outside of an SMA, a seasonal management area, by surprise, well, then uh, we create one of the, NOAA creates these dynamic areas. It's that gray box. If a boat approaches one of those, up pops this little um, uh, box that you're seeing, window that you're seeing on the top. You've entered a voluntary right well management area. Um, please go 10 knots or less. So this is a way of letting um, mariners know what's required of them to minimize their impact and their chance and risk of hurting whales. So it's been extremely helpful for mariners. And really now, um, Whale Alert is used throughout the country. We actually have it being used in the Arabian Sea, um, all through Canada, uh, Alaska. So it's, it's really, it started on Still Wagon Bank, uh, but now it's, it's really used worldwide uh, with the goal, of course, of keeping whales from being hit by ships. Uh, these are humpback whales that you're seeing here, um, not right whales, but the whole idea is to either separate whales and ships in space and time, or alert mariners so that they can go slow enough that the whales will either get out of the way or if they are struck, um, the damage will be minimal. Dr. David Wiley, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and thank you for the work you do to protect our whale friends. Uh, it was very good to speak to you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, fun, fun time. Oh, hey, and I know that surfer, that's Nancy Downs from Oceana in Massachusetts. Uh, how's it going, Nancy? Thank you, Brian, it's going great. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name's Nancy, I'm a native New Englander, born and raised. I spend a lot of time on the water here in Massachusetts, as you can see from my many surfboards. Um, this is a picture of me surfing Good Harbor in Gloucester just last month. I love paddle boarding all over Cape Cod and the Charles River, which is just down the street from me. Um, I'm excited to be working for Oceana in Massachusetts and wanted to talk to everyone about the Business Alliance for Protecting the Atlantic Coast. It's the leading voice of businesses working to protect the Atlantic Ocean. And as I mentioned, I'm active uh, in ocean recreation. So it's surfing, paddle boarding, kayaking, scuba diving. And this includes businesses like whale watches. So let's not also forget ocean tourism and a really important industry in New England is the seafood industry. Did you know the Business Alliance for Protecting the Atlantic Coast represents 42,000 East Coast businesses and half a million commercial fishing families, and they're all united to protect the Atlantic Ocean. So if you or someone you know owns an East Coast business in coastal tourism, ocean recreation, maybe you belong to a chamber of commerce or a tourism board, or you're part of the fishing and seafood industry, please consider joining the Business Alliance for Protecting the Atlantic Coast. We've provided three different ways for you to learn more and join. You'll see a QR code in the middle of the screen. And if you've never used one before, it's pretty cool. You turn on your cell phone, your camera, focus on the code, and it will automatically take you to the Business Alliance sign-on form. Alternatively, there's a link on the left, and you can please follow the Business Alliance on Facebook and Instagram. Um, while we're giving folks a second to check that out, letting you know in 2020, the Business Alliance submitted position letters to the Speaker of the House. They submitted opinion and editorial pieces in local newspapers. And on occasion, some lucky members of the Business Alliance have participated either in person or they've literally flown to Washington, DC to have meetings with their senators and members of Congress. These whales are politely requesting the pleasure of your company as new Business Alliance members. And as much as these whales can hold their own business meetings in the ocean, they don't have a voice at the table. We really need strong business leadership and a strong voice in support of a clean coast economy. I just wanna say thank you to all of the speakers on this virtual whale watch tonight and thank you, Brian. Who, Nancy, are those two people in the ocean? What I wanna know, Brian, is how do we follow them? Well, that's pretty easy. If you want to find out about more virtual programming from Oceana, uh, please follow me at Oceana in New York. And uh, again, uh, you can go to our Q&A and ask about our, uh, our Whale Week program uh, for this week. 
And if you'd like to follow me, I'm at Oceana in Massachusetts. And the work we're doing here in New England is to reduce single-use plastic pollution at the local, state, and federal level. We're building opposition to plans that would involve expanding offshore oil and gas drilling, and of course, protecting these majestic and beautiful whales that are passing through our gorgeous New England coastline. And you know, we're just about finished with our whale watch, but there are a lot of questions that have come in, quite a few for Dr. Robbins. Um, uh, I have a couple to uh, take up. Uh, Dr. Robbins, what, what would you, it sounds like the question is, what would you like people to take away from their whale watch in the Gulf of Maine? What do you want people to know after a whale watch in the Gulf of Maine? Well, I, I guess I would say you've heard today how much we know about humpback whales here, how we know them as individuals, how we follow them throughout our, out their lives. And it's, it really is an amazing amount of information um, that we know, particularly for this area because of the long-term research and, and other factors. But I guess what I would hope people would take away from that is first, how important it is um, that we protect them and that we feel as individuals that stewardship for them. But then also to never take it for granted. Um, we are so close to a city, we're in an urban neighborhood um, it's, I find it amazing that we can just go out on the water and we're with these immense animals. Um, we have the opportunity to know them so well through very careful um, research and data collection protocols. And I, I just hope people would never um, become jaded to that. You know, it's, it's a truly amazing, amazing thing. And you know, there's actually another, there are quite a few questions for you actually, uh, another one. How long do humpback whales live? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier on that one of the things that we've uh, worked on are techniques for aging whales when we didn't actually see them as calves, which is true for many whales, salt being one of them, for example. Um, and as it turns out, prior to all that, a lot of what we knew uh, about whales was from whaling data. And back in the day from whaling data, looking at, looking at whales physically, the idea was that they were probably going to only become um, about 50 years of age, that that was likely the maximum lifespan. Now, as we continue on, we're still trying to figure that out, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that they may actually um, live to on the order of 100 years. Now there are, we've only been studying whales, um, you know, for a little over uh, four decades, in the mid four decades. And um, so it's going to take another whole lifetime of a scientist, essentially, to be able to really know that answer, unless we figure it out through science. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Uh, Dr. Wiley, a question for you. Uh, what does tagging do for whale conservation? We see, you know, we saw the uh, we saw the visualization of how they fish, but how does that tagging, you know, how do you use it for conservation as well? Yeah, one of the real goals of that project is to look at water column use of humpback whales and then see how that makes them vulnerable to human activities such as ship strikes and entanglement. And what those data show us is that humpbacks most of their time either in the top portion of the water column, the top 20 meters or so, because they, that's where their bubbles are most effective and they have to, of course, come to the surface to breathe. And then they spend the other most of their time right along the bottom uh, because that's where Sandlance uh, fish spend a lot of their time also. So they spend about 70% of their time within the strike zone of a boat. You know, think of the draft of a boat extending down maybe 10 meters at least um, and fishing gear extending from the bottom up to about five meters. So they spend about 70% of their time vulnerable Either, either being hit by a boat or caught in fishing gear. So that's pretty extraordinary if you think of it. So um, they live pretty dangerous lives. You're asking what it's like to be a, a humpback whale earlier. It's a pretty dangerous life. They have to do those things to eat and to breathe. Um, so they don't have a choice. So the only thing that we can do really is, is modify our activity in those spaces because uh, whales don't have a choice. They have to live, they have to eat, they have to breathe. Um, so those are the kind of things that we hope to learn and emphasize through those tagging studies. Dr. David Wiley, thank you. And Laura, a question for you. Several people are wanting to know how they can keep up with the next boat that's going out for an in-person 
whale watch with Boston Harbor cruises. Great. So yeah, so right now it's the winter. So we are we have typically we don't whale watch in the off season in the cold weather. Um, a great way you can check our website, bostonharborcruises.com, and also our partners at the New England Aquarium, NAQ.org. Uh, we typically start in the spring. Uh, to start joining us on physically on whale watch boats. We also have a blog that you can check out at the Boston Harbor Cruises website. So you can track all of our sightings that we've seen over the last several years as well. So a lot you can digest over the winter time until you can get back out on the water. Well, thank you, Laura. And thank you everybody very much for joining us tonight for our virtual whale watch. Uh, we really appreciate everybody caring about these beautiful creatures. And uh, as Nancy mentioned, do get in touch with us about the Business Alliance protecting the Atlantic coast. Oceana is determined to make sure we have a, uh, a healthy Atlantic Ocean uh, for our coastal environment as well as our coastal economy. And uh, we're just gonna leave you on this page so that you can check out all of our uh, fantastic speakers tonight and support some of these really incredible organizations. Until next time, thanks again. Bye-bye.